Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Saturday of the month, which means it's time for the Arthritis Recovery Hour with Clint Pattison. Please welcome him back to the show. Hello, Clint, all the way from Australia. Yeah. Yeah, super excited to be back. Thanks so much. And uh, it's so much fun to connect with you. Um, you know, I, I hosted a conference recently here in Australia, a big plant-based conference, and I had uh, several people come up to me and say, hey, I saw you on the Chef AJ show. Aww. You've got fans all around the world and they, they really love, you know, and watch every single episode. Well, so it was really great. Really cool. I appreciate that because, I mean, I love that. And thank you. And I and that's why we do this. We want to let people know about as many great people doing great things in all parts of the world, including Australia. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, uh, that the, their passion about you and what you do and all your work was was really coming through. So keep up the wonderful work, all those hard hours that you've put in over so many years and daily live shows. I mean, you you, I'm going for the record. Congratulated. Yeah. <laughs> I've I hit 1,400. Yep. I'm almost three years. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the kind feedback. You know, before, I know you're going to give a wonderful presentation as you often do, but I don't want to forget Leah's question this time because she sent it in last month. Would you mind answering it? Sure. Great. Thanks. She said, this is a question for Clint Patterson. Clint, do you have any advice for people who have non-rheumatoid arthritis? I have three years of hip bursitis and stiff hurting hands with trigger fingers. My doctor put me on diclofenac generic Voltaren. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, so she's got infl inflammation going on, even though it sounds like she hasn't been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And the diagnosis for rheumatoid is normally a visit to a specialist a rheumatologist, and they check things like anti-CCP antibodies and rheumatoid factor in your blood, which is a simple blood test, and they inspect your joints and look for symmetry and swelling and so on. So sounds like she hasn't got rheumatoid, which is awesome because you don't want rheumatoid. And the bursitis in the hip, uh, however, is inflammatory. The trigger finger may have an inflammatory component. So what to do about this? <clears throat> well, she can do all the things that you talk about on your show with probably most of your guests, which is eat a low food, whole whole plant-based diet. Uh, sorry, a low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. And uh, we want to definitely reduce omega-6 intake, which can be pro-inflammatory. And that's what we're going to talk about on this presentation today. We're going to talk all about the inflammation response based on the cell membrane composition of saturated fat and polyunsaturated fat. So this will be a great episode for her to watch. And if she's already doing all of the above of what I've said, then, then this literally could be the difference for her between displaying ongoing progression and alleviating her symptoms. But you know, the diet that you recommend that you eat and I eat maybe for different reasons, isn't much different whether you have rheumatoid arthritis or non-rheumatoid arthritis. Like, It's so true. And the area of mm, sort of probably the most different between the two is that with rheumatoid, we have so many food sensitivities. And so our plan walks people through an elimination process where we take out many of the common food groups that trigger people with inflammatory arthritis, some of which are plant foods like cereal grains, for example. Um, and we then move them through a process and emphasize foods in a reintroduction sequence that are really pro healing for the gut and uh, high in potassium, rich in um, uh, prebiotic fibers that are good for the microbiome. And so we, uh, we, our end result, Chef AJ's end result and Patterson Program's end result look the same. It's the early stages where we have to take them through this sort of get them on the training wheels and learn, teach the gut how to be non reactive again to foods and rebuild gut health. So that's where the different differences are in the early beginning stages. Perfect. And you talked a lot about gut health on last month's show. I did. Yes, it was last month's show. And we also spoke a lot about uh, 
Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll cover that in a second. Where we're up to with this series that we're doing together, I'll share that in a moment. So would you like me to get into this? Sounds good. Well, we're going to cover inflammation, omega-3 fats, and cell membrane optimization. So we're going to look at what is a cell all the way through to what should we eat and why does it matter? Uh, my name is Clint Patterson. I run a business called Rheumatoid Solutions, which is sort of the uh, second evolution of what began as the Patterson program. Now we uh, have uh, involvement with doctors and experts, and we have physical therapists and all sorts of uh, experts in the field, all help our members to reduce inflammation in a collaborative way. So we've evolved from an online course into a service to help people with arthritis. The usual disclaimer for any kind of presentation like this, that it's not medical advice, and this information is based on scientific evidence and also my personal experience helping what is now over 16,000 clients around the world who follow our systems to reduce inflammation. But make sure you check with your doctor because we're all uh, at different stages of our health on different meds. Now, on our series so far, the Chef AJ Arthritis Hour, um, we've covered two presentations that are related to the gut. And the first one was all about diet and how the diet can impact the microbiome and how the microbiome in turn impacts us in so many different ways. And then the second presentation was regarding medications because the gut is so sensitive to medications because the gut has to metabolize everything that goes in through the mouth. And this includes the drugs that we take orally. And so we need to make sure that we're not taking two steps forward with our diet, but then going three steps backwards with the drugs that we're taking for the condition. And so I would urge anyone who hasn't seen those two uh, presentations to go back and watch those because this is all part of the big picture, which is how to regain confidence and control over your uh, arthritic uh, uh, symptoms. And today we are going to jump down to the lower right hand quadrant, which we're going to look at the cellular health solution, right? So we're going to dive into that now. So what to expect in this presentation? We'll just go into what are cells because they're not something that we think about day to day. Uh, how cell membrane composition is linked to inflammation the impact of dietary fats, both saturated fat and polyunsaturated fats on your cellular health, how to optimize your cell membrane composition via diet. We're going to touch upon supplementation of omega-3s and if this is necessary or not, and if so, how you should go about it. And something really cool is that you can now do home tests for your omega-6 to 3 ratio. And so we're going to cover that and how you can get that done and the benefits of all of implementing all of this <clears throat> in terms of reducing systemic inflammation, higher tolerance of more calorie dense foods, meaning that you'll be able to eat higher fat foods without consequence and the reduction of food sensitivities, which as we just discussed in our um, chat a moment ago, is really prevalent in people with inflammatory arthritis. So let's get stuck into it. Now, I apologize for the labeling on this diagram. Two days ago, I emailed my graphic designer and said, can you fix up all of the labels so they show up better on a presentation? And uh, I got no reply from my guy. So uh, they are a little hard to see, but that's okay. I'll walk you through that in just a moment. But first of all, what are cells? Cells are the building blocks to all living organisms. And what's really crazy when I was researching this for my book, so the content today is coming from my upcoming book. Uh, and what I, what I found is that um, what's crazy, because we don't think about this too much, is that we, we originate from just one cell that, can, that just divides and divides and divides. And that one cell, which is called the zygote, is actually a combination of... Uh, uh, your father's uh, composition and your mum's composition when they come together in that magic loving moment. And they combine to create this single cell. And that single cell divides and divides and divides in an insane number of, of, of replications. And each cell has a slightly different 
function and form in the body. So we end up with around 30 trillion cells, which is just absolutely mind blowing. And we create something like 2 million blood cells every minute. So the number of cells that are being produced, recreated, dying, cleaned out of our body at any one time is beyond our capacity of comprehension. Um, and they all come in different types. So I mentioned blood cells, which are freely moving in the body, but then we'll have, for example, muscle cells, which are tightly packed together to form muscle tissue. So they are building blocks. Think of tiny little, the most fundamental Lego pieces that make up all of our body. The cells are complicated, very complex, but for the purposes of our presentation today of understanding inflammation, uh, we only need to focus on one area of the cell, and that is the cell membrane. But just for completeness, there are a couple of other interesting parts of a cell that are worth just revisiting, which is the nucleus of the cell, which is obviously the center and heart of the cell. This is where our DNA is. Um, uh, and also we have in there the uh, mitochondria, which is the energy center of the cell. And this is the energy in the cell is produced from the oxygen that we breathe in. So as we take a breath in, we bring in oxygen to all of our cells and with the food that we're consuming. And so those tiny food um, uh, particles that end up uh, consequently from after our food is digested enter the bloodstream. They can combine with the oxygen in the cells and are created, uh, sorry, are, are, are stored as energy, uh, as ATP inside the cell. So that's how it works. So we've got all these cells, crazy numbers that are uh, inside us and they are being fueled by our oxygen and food. Okay, so on to the next slide here. So let's just look at the cell membrane. So here we're just totally drilling down on the membrane that encapsulates the outer portion of each one of these cells. The important thing to know here, firstly, is that the cell membrane has proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Sometimes we think of it as only fats, whereas actually the bulk of the weight of a cell membrane is actually coming from the proteins. And, uh, and the proteins, carbohydrates, and the fats make up that cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane itself is mostly optimally composed of opposite facing polyunsaturated fats. And you'll see over here on the far right, it says a bilipid, bi meaning two, lipid meaning fat. So two fat layer. And there are two carbon bonds in the structure of the polyunsaturated fat. And this gives it a little kink. And as a result, when they face each other in an opposite way, the kinks in the carbon chains means that they don't pack too closely together. Consequently, these membranes have fluidity to them. They can allow nutrients into the cell and they can allow the cell to exhale and to get out of the cell some toxins, waste and whatever. This is a really, really uh, optimum um, situation for the cell because it needs to communicate or to exchange nutrients in that manner. So a healthy cell is a flexible cell and one that has a fluid membrane. And this is achieved through polyunsaturated fats. This creates the fluidity. Saturated fats can also end up in the cell membrane. And the saturated fats do not have that double carbon bond. And as a result, they can pack really tightly. Tightly packed saturated fats in our cell membrane leads to cell rigidity or stiffness, not allowing nutrients to flow through the cell membrane. Rigidity is associated with rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and obesity. And in studies, it's found that rigidity is associated with inflammatory markers of rheumatoid arthritis like SED rate or ESR. So, uh, just some references there. We need to reduce our intake of saturated fat. Now, where does saturated fat come from? 
all of the classics, the sort of the, the no-go list on Chef AJ's channel. You'll see every other presenter say similar things. We want to avoid these foods. These foods are not exactly uh, uh, controversial to omit. I mean, if you look at all government guidelines, there are typically recommendations about upper limits of saturated fat because they are known to have negative health consequences. But now we can put that also in terms of cell membrane composition because we want to reduce the saturated fat from a point of view of making sure that our cell membranes have more fluidity and are not tightly packed and rigid because of saturated fat. So, so far, so good. Okay, so we've talked about saturated fat. We know that if we reduce saturated fat, we can make our cell membranes more fluid. And in doing so, we know that this reduces the inflammatory markers of folks with inflammatory arthritis and most likely other inflammatory conditions. And we saw earlier uh, some commentary around some other conditions on an earlier slide. And so then we ask, what about the polyunsaturated fats in the membrane? So these are fats that are liquid at room temperature. Saturated fats are all solids at room temperature. So that's why we see all the meats, also coconut oil. It's a real little tricky one because coconut oil is actually a solid at room temperature. So it's a saturated fat. But what about the polyunsaturated fats? Okay, so let's talk about those now. So these are oils. These are stuff that are liquids. And it gets a little more complicated if you look at this slide, but I'm going to walk you through this. So don't feel overwhelmed. We're just going to go through some key points here and I'll explain why I even put something so complicated onto a presentation. The reason is, is because this is the pathway of the creation of the long chain polyunsaturated fats that end up in our cell membranes because they don't look like the ones that we eat. Our body has to convert the polyunsaturated fats from the ones that we eat into the ones that end up being suitable for our cell membranes. So there are two pathways. <clears throat> there is one to create the omega-6s, long chain, and there's one to create the omega-3s, long chain. So again, they start out short chain and they go through a process and end up long chain. This happens in the liver. Okay, so the liver does all of this magical conversion for us and the liver uses enzymes to do the conversion across several steps. And so that's what's being depicted here in the diagrams. We've got down the left-hand column, the, the omega-6 pathway from short chain to long. And on the right hand, we've got the omega-3 pathway from short chain to long. So they start out on the left here, the omega-6 with linoleic acid. So this can often be found in processed foods, cookies and things like that, uh, animal fats, vegetable oils, things like sunflower oil, safflower oil, corn oil, all things like that. They are linoleic acid. And then a few enzymes are applied to this, like that more carbon bonds are added, uh, some manipulation is done, and then eventually they come out the other end as arachidonic acid. On the right-hand side, we've got the omega-3. So we think of these in terms of the majority of the composition of polyunsaturated fats in chia and flaxseed. And they are alpha linoleic acid, omega-3s, and they go through the exact same enzymatic process to end up then coming out the other end as EPA and uh, DHA. A lot of you be familiar with the uh, discussions around brain health and DHA, since it's an it's a, uh, important fat for brain health. And the EPA is more associated with inflammation reduction. We're going to talk about all that in just another few slides. <clears throat> so let me give a metaphor after I, first of all, just show you that at the bottom of this, I'm just going to show you, uh, we've got that same cell membrane diagram again, the one we used earlier. So at the end of this process, those long chain polyunsaturated fats enter and become parts of our cell membrane. So it's the classic, you are what you eat in a very literal way. The saturated fats, the polyunsaturated fats, we are literally from a fat point of view, 
what we eat. So let's think of this now in terms of metaphor that uh, I ad-libbed with our friend Cyrus from Mastering Diabetes on a, one of his summits. Imagine you had a factory and that factory makes sweaters. And the factory only makes two different types of sweaters, blue sweaters and red sweaters. Now, at the start of the factory line, we naturally have to provide the material to manufacture those sweaters. And so we can put red material in and the workers will then proceed to take that red material along the way and build the sleeves and put on the cuffs and everything and end up being a red sweater. Likewise, if we put blue fabric in the start of the manufacturing line, the workers will grab that blue fabric and the same workers will then work on those blue sweaters and sorry, blue uh, uh, processes until we've got a completely blue sweater. Then at the end of that, what happens is then those red sweaters and blue sweaters get displayed in the windows of the department store. So if you were to look into the window of the department store from the pedestrian uh, side of it, you would look in, you would see all these red sweaters, all these blue sweaters, and the ratio of those sweaters would correspond roughly to the ratio of the amount of material of red or blue that was put in at the start. So we're going to pick up this metaphor again shortly, but I just want to set that platform so that you can see how that process works. Now, where it gets really interesting is what happens when the cell membrane kicks out those sweaters into circulation. Because a lot of us previously may have thought, well, the the the, the, the sort of composition itself somehow influences inflammation, but the detail is, is really crucial. And that's what happens when those long chain polyunsaturated fats, which are the sweater version, are in the membrane and then they get kicked out. So this could happen through an enzymatic trigger. The body says, I need those fats now, or it can have happen from cell death. So the cell dies, they get released into circulation, which is the bloodstream. Um, or it can happen from oxidative stress. So there's 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 an environment where the cell is not well and the cell is releasing fats because they're getting oxidized. Okay. So if that happens, then another two pathways present themselves. These two pathways are the ones that are on the screen now. And enzymatic activity happens on the freely available polyunsaturated omega-6 fats. And enzymatic pathways happen on the freely available EPA and DHA. The, the uh, pathway that results in the enzymatic activity of the long chain omega-6s results in eicosanoids as I've labeled down here, which can be pro-inflammatory. By contrast, as a result of the enzymatic activity on the long chain polyunsaturated fats that are kicked out of the cell membrane, you can have anti-inflammatory metabolites. Um, and the, the pro-inflammatory, the prostaglandins and thromboxanes, these are what create the redness, the inflammation that we see in our joints, or if we, if we have some kind of inflammatory response. And they are the exact enzymes that are targeted by aspirin and ibuprofen. So what we are seeing here is the behind the scenes science on what these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs do. They are trying to inhibit this enzymatic conversion from the free omega-6s that have been bumped out of our cell membranes into the creation of the pro-inflammatory eicosanoids. So we can actually influence the quantity of these COX enzymes here and the production of the eicosanoids through dietary manipulation so that we end up having a greater percentage of the blue sweaters 
in our cell membranes that when they are kicked out and broken down, and let's imagine they then become just some sleeves, some blue sleeves and a blue chest piece, well, they are anti-inflammatory compared to the red sleeves that are separated and the red chest piece, which are the eicosanoids on the omega-6 pathway. We can manipulate our diet and end up having more uh, uh, of the omega-3 long chains in our membrane. So what matters most is the ratio, okay? Because if you have, say, 50 red sweaters, putting into the pathway. But if you put in a hundred blue sweaters, remember that the workers work with what they've got. You're going to end up with more blue sweaters. Okay. So the, the what we know historically uh, in our evolution is typically humans evolved on a ratio of the short chain consumption of omega sixes and threes to a ratio of around one to one. And the studies are pretty consistent with this. Today in Western culture, we're putting 25 times more omega six short chain fats into our body typically than what we are omega threes. It's considered healthy, sufficiently healthy, as long as we're less than five to one. That's, that's five times more sixes than one. Okay, that is considered perfectly healthy. The Japanese, however, believe that it needs to be more like two, two to one, which is more similar to what our evolutionary past used to be. Right. So the reason that it is considered healthier to have a lower omega-6 to 3 ratio and countries are putting in guidelines to to go down this path is that a lower ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s in our cell membranes is associated with a lower incidence or severity of several chronic diseases including cardiovascular disease cancer osteoporosis and inflammatory and autoimmune diseases that's what the science is indicating there are some of the references for that so it's pretty easy to understand that if we want to work on our ratio, the easiest way to go about this is just reduce the intake of omega-6s. And this is an extremely effective way to go about it because some of the oils that we consume if we're casual in our eating or we're unaware of Chef AJ's channel can be so heavy in omega-6s that it makes it virtually impossible for our manufacturing process to end up any making any of our blue sweaters. If you have a look at this particular table here, if you look at coconut oil, for example, it has 504 milligrams of omega-6 and absolutely zero omega-3. So if you were to do as the paleo community, keto community would suggest, and go and fry up something in coconut oil, then you are getting, an, a, in terms of a mathematical equation, an infinite amount of coconut oil compared to your, sorry, infinite amount of omega-6 compared to omega-3. Flaxseed oil on this list, which is the second one down, is the only one with a positive relationship. The rest, as you can see, are very, very pro-omega-6. That's the canola oil, walnut, olive oil, sunflower oil, corn oil, peanut oil, more. Take a look at safflower oil down the bottom. This is an oil that's sometimes used in deep frying cookers. And if you ever think about having a uh, some French fries because you're vegan, you think, oh, you know, I'm healthy, I can go and have French fries. Think again when it comes to deep fried restaurant cooking like at, at uh, uh, you know, any restaurant that making like uh, these hot chips, whatever, you're getting so much omega-6 and, and zero omega-3 that it, it really skews that ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s. The, the impact is, is massive. So with folks with rheumatoid arthritis, I call these seed oils the kryptonite for rheumatoid. So much so 
that, dare I say, I see far greater impact of the oils, even if someone cheats on that, as people cheat sometimes, than when they cheat on a, a dairy yogurt or even have a steak. Not that people do that frequently, but of course, I've been in this game for 10 years and I know that people do this sometimes. The consequences are far greater from the oils and it's immediate. Right. So this is like the huge takeaway. We need to reduce this omega-6 intake of seed and vegetable oils. So the question often comes up, what about this, this lot here? These are some commonly eaten foods that people love. I've touched upon coconut oil. Coconut oil is just junk food. It's got no fiber, no nutrients. It's just pure saturated fat that is going to throw out your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Um, you know, it, it is just, it's just manufactured junk, right? So forget that. Next, we've got olive oil, everyone's favorite. So olive oil actually is mostly composed of omega-9 fats. And this is something we haven't even discussed yet in this presentation. The three fats, are, the three polyunsaturated fats are omega-3, 6, and 9. The nines, your body manufactures itself. And it's kind of the, the Switzerland of uh, oils. It's sort of neutral, doesn't play a role in either of the earlier two pathways of pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. And because olive oil is mostly omega-9, it doesn't really fit the category of what we've been talking about thus far. However, the fats that it does have in it in omega-3s and 6 are skewered heavily towards 6s, 14 to 1. And so one could argue that it has maybe a slight inflammatory impact. And then people say, well, what about the Mediterranean diet, et cetera, et cetera. And so because there's so many studies and so many arguments and so much debate, I just stick with the rheumatoid arthritis uh, literature. And in the studies that have been done in the rheumatoid arthritis literature, there is no anti-inflammatory impact of consuming olive oil. Okay, there is none. So there is no benefit from an anti-inflammatory point of view of consuming olive oil, according to the studies. And um, therefore, you know, we then need to take it on the on the viewpoint of of are oils good for you. Uh, on the next slide, I'm going to show you on the next slide. Okay, so olive oil and avocado oil, which is the next on the screen here, uh, pretty much a similar argument. So what I've said about olive oil applies to avocado oil without the studies on RA. I can't find any. It's just not been investigated. And then we look at nuts and seeds. So nuts and, sorry, and uh, the nuts. So nuts are great if you are looking to put on weight. Nuts are great as an additional source of fiber to vary up your um, diversity for your microbiome. Some nuts like pistachios have particular antioxidants like melatonin that can have some health benefits. And so overall, nuts can be eaten in moderation, but not when you're highly inflamed. So again, earlier at the start, Chef AJ and I, we spoke about the differences between our plans. And I said, one of the big differences is the food sensitivities. Corresponding with that is the need to stay very low fat. Also, I think Chef AJ, you and I are on board with that. Um, so let's talk about the gradual dietary fat increase that is needed to compensate for an inability to handle high fat foods when we are in dysbiosis and we are inflamed. Okay. So a fatty liver, a liver that results from eating too much of a Western diet equals a preferential conversion of omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids. This means that if you have a lot of saturated fat in your diet, you will end up with having cell composition that will preferentially make more of the red sweaters over the blue sweaters 
even if there were an equal amount put in at the start of the two different color fabric. Okay, so that's crucial. And I think this is one of the, the, the key differentiators is to why we need to stay low fat when we are coming at this and looking to improve our health. We need to start with the low fat platform. In addition to that strong position, all fats increase oxidative stress through advanced glycation end products. This is important too, because advanced glycation end products, and I'll talk more about oxidative stress in a future presentation. It's des It deserves an entire presentation. It's got a chapter in my book and I'll go through that. Oxidative stress is a position in the body where we are creating more free radicals than what we are able to uh, offset through our own antioxidant supplies. So when we consume foods that are high in free radicals, then we tip ourselves further into an oxidative stress environment. And the studies on rheumatoid arthritis are really fascinating in this area because oxidative stress markers actually correlate with disease activity like inflammation markers. So you can actually use oxidative stress as a marker of disease activity because of the amount of oxidative stress that's going on in folks with rheumatoid arthritis. So we don't want to increase oxidative stress via advanced glycation end products. And it happens regardless of fat source. Okay, so we can't get away from it. Next, all fats create bile acid production, and there is an interplay with bile acid production and intestinal permeability. That's a little complex, but I don't feel comfortable with it. And I think it's another area where we've got to be cautionary with fat intake when we have dysbiosis or leaky gut, a microbiome imbalance, as we've talked about in our first presentation together. And then 8% of RA patients have villus atrophy. So this is a, a damage of those tiny villi that are on the intestinal wall that increase the surface area of our gut to be able to absorb more nutrients from the foods that we eat. As a result of that, we have less pancreatic enzyme lipase secretion. What does this mean in simple terms? It means we don't have the little scissors or enzymes created from our pancreas to help break down fats. This is a small portion of the RA population. However, that combined with all of the other bullet points on this screen really lead to anecdotally me observe that virtually everyone with RA just does better on a low fat plan, a whole foods, low fat plant-based diet. And then with time, as their liver health improves because they've gone to a plant-based diet, and they've eliminated those, uh, those toxic sources of processed foods and saturated fat and overeating uh, protein cholesterol, the liver improves and then it gets back into balance with its uh, um, um, processing in a, in a regular way of the short chain and long chain omega-3 fats. It's been shown that people who are on a plant-based vegan diet have more omega-3 fats in their blood than those on an omnivorous diet. And so we don't need to be concerned with eliminating um, meat products uh, or um, high omega-6s from our diet. The studies on this are, are sound, and so it's, uh, it's all good. Now, even hero omega-3 foods like flax have no impact on C-reactive protein. So a study was done on cardiovascular patients and a study was also done on rheumatoid arthritis patients where a large amount of flax in this rheumatoid study, 30 grams a day, was put into the diet without any other dietary change. And after six weeks on that plan, the folks who were consuming the high intake of flax seeds reported that they had less pain and their disease activity scores, which is uh, into like a checkup from their doctor, showed that they did better. However, their C-reactive protein, which is the key inflammatory marker, their SED rate, as well as rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibodies were all unchanged compared to people who didn't add the flax. This is supported also by a meta-analysis literature review across 
healthy adults who consume uh, more flax. There's no change in C-reactive protein, the key inflammatory marker. So we don't need to chase these higher fat rich omega-3 foods because all of these first aspects of disease management come into play as well. And overall, I can like hand on my heart tell you that I've been doing this a very long time. Start low fat and slowly increase your fat intake as tolerance allows. You can test those foods a little and you'll see, oh, uh, symptoms returning. My, my liver's not quite there yet. I'm still fatty liver from all those burgers I've eaten for 10, 20 years. Um, I'm still, I'm too sensitive with my oxidative stress. I haven't exercised enough to enable myself to tolerate these uh, high fat foods, my glutathione levels uh, and so on, are still too low and so on. All right. Now, most importantly, well, I think we've already cleared up the no oil, but most importantly, <laughs> never cook with it. Okay, so what happens is when we cook with oils, it goes from basically being a bad food to like the worst thing you could do, which is why the inflammatory response is so great with people with arthritis. And I'm not sure if I told this story in our previous Chef AJ presentations, but certainly in other ones of my live presentations uh, on my own channel, on uh, Rheumatoid Solutions YouTube channel. You don't want to cook with oil because um, I ex experienced firsthand that even if you're in a state of stability, as I was for my rheumatoid arthritis for like five years, I ate a deep fried set of potato wedges and a big oily veggie burger at a US restaurant. It was late at night, no antioxidants. And that set me back the next day. And it set me back for a long time. I uh, Symptoms resumed for the very first time in many years. And it was very hard to get symptoms back under control again. And that led me to all the research in the negative impacts of cooking oils. They become a free radical bomb. So it's it's tremendous amount of oxidative stress arises from doing so um, because these fats are very sensitive to oxidation. The fats are sensitive to oxidation, which is why olive oil, for example, is always in dark bottles at the grocery store it's because light can oxidize it heat oxidizes it and so when you heat it to very high temperatures on a hot plate hot plate you're going to an order of magnitude of more free radicals in the body what about supplementation so the research shows us that it's actually really hard to get to the optimal target of five to one or below with diet alone I've found this myself and I see this with clients, even who are doing everything that I know is to be right. We know that Western diet is approximately 25 to one. We know that vegans are better than that. They tend to be less than 14 to one or less than 20 to one, but that's still quite a ways from the five to one. Rheumatoid solutions or the Patterson program, we haven't measured it. I haven't done a, a study or even just asked, um, I, I've, I haven't actually got any kind of data on this other than what I observe from the feedback of others who are testing this. And I'm seeing typical results anywhere from, uh, I've, I've seen some five to ones through to as high as 76 to one for people with rheumatoid arthritis who are just about to start our program but I don't have a before and after. I don't have data on people who've been plant-based on our program for a long time. So omega-3 supplementation may help. This is optional. This is something that's worthwhile having a discussion around. The studies suggest that there are benefits for folks with rheumatoid arthritis. So you know how these studies present their conclusions. It's not like uh, in these instances, the, the conclusions are like, maybe of benefit, um, demonstrated uh, benefit in a laboratory setting uh, and maybe of benef benefit is what the meta-analysis say, looking at hundreds of studies across this over the last 40 years. Algae is better. In fact, fish oil is actually contraindicated for many conditions in which there is a lot of oxidative stress. 
So again, I want to highlight this importance that these fats oxidize really fast. And if your body is full of oxidation, which is associated with inflammation, as typical of any rheumatoid arthritis patient who's not in remission, those fats can enter into the body and become oxidized very quickly and never actually reach the cell membranes to which they are intended. As a result of that, you've then got a bunch of oxidative fats circulating in your body. And these, as we'll talk about in the oxidative stress presentation we'll do in the future, Chef AJ, actually are a source themselves of inflammation. And so we must make sure that if we take through supplementation, omega-3 fats, that we take omega-3 fats that are protected from oxidation. Fish oils, which are purified, right? They try and remove the smells. They try and remove the toxins like mercury, which are a real problem in the fish oil industry because our oceans, according to the World Health Organization, have concerning levels of, of, of these uh, heavy metals in all of the fishing areas in the world. So if we're then, um, uh, so, so they purify them, remove the natural antioxidants, which are present in the actual uh, uh, original version of the oil and sell them as supplements. So algae, it's just as good. It doesn't need to be more expensive. It is sustainable. It doesn't deplete the fish stocks, the oceans. It is better for the environment. And because the algae comes with built-in antioxidants, it's actually better and more effective for the body. Okay. And then even though the, uh, it has those features, it's still best to consume if you do do supplementation of omega-3s with a meal rich in antioxidants. So you want that meal that you have, you want lots of leafy greens in that meal. You want to maybe eat alongside with the meal also maybe have some fruit because we need as much protection to chaperone that those antioxidants, that, that, those delicate uh, free fats into our cell membranes where they belong. So you should find out what your omega-6 to 3 ratio is. And so I have identified after a long search, the best home testing kit that I believe exists. And I've put details of that over at rheumatoidsolutions.com forward slash omega-3. You can get a home-based kit that is sent to your house. You open it up, you prick your little thumb or finger with a tiny little uh, included little uh, loaded, spring-loaded uh, pricker. And the blood goes on to a little uh, piece of cardboard. You put it back into a self-replied envelope, put it in the mail, off it goes. Two weeks later, you get your results. Is an online comprehensive data. And uh, you go through that and you can learn what your omega-6 to 3 ratio is, what your omega-3 status, arachidonic acid, the whole thing all comprehensively laid out for you. The great thing about that is then you can make an evidence based decision as to whether or not your current dietary plan needs adjusting, whether or not you might want to explore a supplement, or whether or not you should high five your family members and say, we're crushing it. We've got our omega-6 to 3 ratio below 5, therefore nothing left to look at in this area of our health management. The supplement that I take is also on that page. And the reason I'm not going to mention that is because over the years, if someone's watching this in three, four years time from now, I may have found a better alternative. So this is just going to be the location of where I feel uh, the, the optimum testing and also the optimum uh, products are at, and it will change with time. So we want to measure what matters. With rheumatoid, we measure our joint range of motion. We measure vitamin D status because that's crucial. We measure our C-reactive protein and our SED rate to keep an eye on our inflammation. We measure our joints for erosion via x-rays and ultrasounds. And we also keep an eye on things where necessary with MRIs. And now we want to also measure our omega-6 to 3 ratio because of the strong evidence to support an association between a better omega-6 to 3 ratio with better inflammatory outcomes. So the key messages are we want to start with a low but adequate 
fat intake on a whole food plant-based diet. If we eat all plants and eat at the early stages of our program, we want to emphasize lots and lots of leafy greens. And we're trying to hit 1.6 grams of ALA a day, which is uh, for an adult male, which is 1.1 gram. I, I'm going off memory, I think, for uh, adult females, but you'll want to check that for your own. This, it's hard to get there. It is hard. We're just hitting the leafy greens. You have to eat a lot of leafy greens. Um, you may want to add an optional, just a tiny little bit of ground flax if it's of concern. You can go onto an app like Chronometer, I think it's called, and many of these are apps that show you dietary intake based on the data you put in for how much sweet potatoes you ate, how much quinoa you ate, and it'll give you that feedback. So just check that. We want zero dietary oils and never, ever, 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 ever cook with oils or eat foods that have been cooked with oils. If you're inflamed, that is your kryptonite. As we improve our digestive health, our microbiome, and especially our liver, we'll be able to increase our fat intake if we want to, if that's something that we would like. If we're not worried about adding a few extra pounds or we want to just go to the gym, we need some more calories, then things like nuts and seeds can be eaten in moderation um, to help us uh, to achieve that. And then algae omega-3s can be considered. Take a look at your omega-6 to 3 ratio first, uh, either via the link that I shared or you're in the States. Um, I think Quest Labs will even run omega-6 to 3 ratio. Ask your doctor if you want to go down that path, if it's covered by insurance, for example. And so you can find that out through uh, different ways if you want to go down a different path. And if you do supplement, make sure the supplement uh, contains an antioxidant. Um, in my case, I there is a small amount of polyphenols associated with a small amount of olive oil alongside the algae, which is a, a very effective chaperone for the uh, omega-3s to enter the cells. That's what I do. Um, you can look into that approach, or if you're only using foods with your supplement, make sure you're eating it with lots of antioxidants. Okay, that's me. And I don't have a last slide, which again is just, uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm over at uh, rheumatoidsolutions.com. Uh, and um, I'm grateful, Chef AJ, that I can share this information with your audience. Thank you. You These seem very well researched, everything you present, and I love your presentations. And um, if you want, you can stop screen share now. I can do that okay. for you so we can see you bigger. So I, I have a question. You know, those home tests, I got one once, and I was just too squeamish to prick my own finger. And so I ended up just going to Quest Lab and getting the blood test. And I'm curious, um, is, the, is the finger stick as accurate as when a phlebotomist actually draws blood from you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, of course, they're all different. I can only speak to the one that I use, which I've researched. Um, it's basically, uh, the lab is based in Norway. They've got the largest sample of omega-6 to 3 ratios of the human population of anywhere on earth. Um, and what they do is they run all sorts of analysis on the blood. And the studies are really strong, equating the cell membrane composition of human blood cells to the cell membrane composition elsewhere in the body. So it's a good representation. And so, yes, uh, you can feel reassured that the data is accurate. And, um, and that's right. It's an alternative if you want to incorporate it with a with a quest lab but i mean you still got to draw blood right so i know but it's, it's it's harder for, it was hard i couldn't do it myself i just could not prick my own finger i was just a baby what can i tell yeah, you yeah. these things are self-loaded so you just put it against the finger and it just like yeah. a little gun it just get bang and suddenly it's over and then yeah so but it is an option they could go to the lab if oh, they wanted to that's oh, great oh, yeah when you, when you talk about nuts in moderation clint what is moderation because i don't know what it is well, see, I'm not worried, like a lot of your audience are worried about putting on weight or and, and they've learned from you how to avoid that. And so if there is a concern around that, then maybe what I'm about to say isn't relevant. Um, but for my audience, I've got an audience of folks who through inflammatory 
um, 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 metabolites and inflammatory cytokines, they have muscle atrophy. It hurts them to move their joints. They're scared of eating because food sensitivities, oils, all these things, they all cause inflammation. So we've got a community of people who are generally struggling with good muscle mass. Those folks are looking for ways to add more calories so that they can either just have a more of a, 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 a active mind and feel more alert during the day with extra calories or be able to engage in the exercises that I all I try and get them all to do, which is go to the gym or do some home workouts with our you know home uh, uh, upper body and lower body workouts in our program and just build muscle mass. Okay, now corresponding with that is a desire to eat some more calorie dense foods, and therefore um, some nut seeds are going to fit into that. Moderation is normally dictated by the person's ability to eat those foods in rheumatoid arthritis. At the start, they're a no-go. People inflame, people get inflamed. Later down the track, like I can eat handfuls of nuts and so forth, no issue, but eh, it's just because I enjoy them as a treat almost. And uh, if I want to make up because I had a light lunch and I'm hungry in the afternoon, there we go. But otherwise, I at the moment, I'm, I, it's not something I do every day. What about the fat from avocado? Yeah, so I'll have that from time to time in a salad or so forth. Again, with, with an avocado, you've got more of an omega-6 load than what you have omega-3. But what we have to take into account, and, and I'm glad you asked that question, is that everything I've spoken about today is only one piece of a puzzle that it's not the ultimate piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole picture. So for example, if you made an omega six to three ratio chart of all the foods and they exist, and you said, I'm only going to concentrate all my efforts into eating as much omega three and as little omega six as possible. And I omitted every other plan. You wouldn't do well. You would not do well because there's so much else going on. For example, like with the uh, um, avocado example, it has vitamins and minerals and polyphenols and healthy fibers, which fuel a microbiome. And, and there's so many other benefits. And so to put it into the no-go zone because of an omega-6 to 3 ratio completely disregards all of the other health benefits of that food. And so this is where we enter into a dangerous over-intellectualizing our foods Okay. And I've tried to keep this as simple as possible in our plan and say, generally speaking, here's your elimination diet and it is low fat. And we want to just meet, but not exceed our daily fat requirements. And then with time, here is the layout of foods that are going to serve you best. And as a general trend, those that are higher in fat calorie density are further down the list, right? It's not, it's, it's, uh, and so avocado is on that list and it is down the list. So you'll get there eventually, but let's wait for your liver to improve and let's wait for those other parameters to adjust so that they don't, the, the food eventually doesn't cause you problems. Great. Well, I love everything you said about oil because I understand why people like fat and why even they believe they need it, but it never, ever has to come from oil. No, I mean, it's a processed food, right? Just like a cookie or something. It takes an enormous factory to make these oils that we see sitting on our con shelves, conveniently located at eye height to, to dose on everything that we eat. You know, we just don't need it. A processed food removed from its original home, like in the case of olive, olives are going to be healthy for you, but remove the oil and you're talking about a completely different item that's going into your body that is unprotected from oxidation that has uh, none of the uh, fiber that was originally there that has a different impact on the body because it's not slowly being released through your 22 feet of intestinal uh, small intestine but suddenly reaching the the stomach and, and upper intestine in a completely different manner so a processed food entirely different to real food now, there's no oil in nature anywhere. And I wish I knew where the love affair with oil started. I can't answer that one. 
I don't, I can't answer. I can't, I don't like the, the, uh, the texture of oil. I don't like cleaning dishes that is, has oil in the meal uh, the water just, just doesn't, you know, you have to use, uh, soaps to get that oil off of plates. Um, this is hard work comparatively to just washing dishes, uh, where they respond to water. And I think it's a good metaphor for the body. Think of the extra work that your body has to do to remove fat oils from it when we're 70% water and we have this fat content that, you know, we know oils and fats don't mix as a call it colloquialism. So you're absolutely right. I find that, um, you know, it's, uh, it's healthy living without the oil. You lack nothing and do your test if you're worried about your omega six to three ratio. And if, if necessary, then we do a little artificial invention because, um, you know, the studies support that. Yeah. You talked about the importance in general of eating greens, but particularly with people that have these inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, but how do you get them to do it? You know? Well, pain is a great motivator and typically uh, I'll get a lot of people pretty compliant on the leafy greens. You'd be surprised actually, Chef AJ, it's harder to get people to exercise than what it is yes, to get them yes. to eat ridiculous I, amounts of I greens. I had that conversation with some lifestyle medicine doctors recently. Yeah. You are so right. And I, that yeah. is the hardest change, I think, for people sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like I reckon I could convince the bulk of my audience to eat anything. But uh, getting them to move their body because that pain or that inertia or that feeling that I'm not someone who does this, but most of all, it's just the discomfort. And so it's it's hard. It's hard. And my my I'm totally empathetic towards that, having had this condition for 17 years. It's not comfortable to move sometimes. So, but we can get them to eat the leafy greens because they feel great. You know, there was a survey of over 300 people with rheumatoid arthritis, and they said, what are the what is your gut feeling, funnily enough, of the most anti-inflammatory foods for your rheumatoid arthritis. And the top two were leafy greens. In fact, it was spinach and blueberries. So antioxidants, fiber-rich plant foods. Great. Well, thank you. This was a wonderful presentation. I appreciate it so much. Thanks so much for having me. Can't wait for the next one. All right. Do you have any idea what you're talking about next time? Well, next time we might want to talk about exercise or we might want to talk about oxidative stress, which I touched upon quite a lot in this presentation. So if the questions come up around that, maybe I'll go there first, but um, we'll uh, we'll go down probably one of those parts, or maybe we can do a Q&A. Maybe we've accumulated enough That's content. That's great because a lot of times people have lots of questions. That'd be fabulous. Whatever you like. We'll chat before. Or we could just do some stand-up together. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? It'd be fun. <laughs> I think so too. That's <laughs> always a pleasure. Thank you so much, Clint. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Dr. Peter Rogers. Take care, everyone.